Very excited to be here. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, statistical machine learning methods, especially as more and more data are getting in, in, uh, collected in electronic health records, much like the kinds of things we heard about today in the microbiome session. And um, how do we use that to enable precision healthcare? So I wanted to start with a quote by Dr. William Mosler. This is circa you know, 1900 when he made this quote. Variability is the law of life. As no two faces are the same, so no two bodies are alike, no two individuals react alike and behave alike under the abnormal conditions which we now know as disease. Um, he is considered very described uh, often as one of the founding fathers of modern medicine. So what we think of now as precision healthcare and precision medicine didn't have that name back in the day, but the idea has been around. So the question is, what's changed? What's interesting? What's new? Why is now such an exciting time? And part of it is, you know, the Affordable Care Act and the revolution it brought around in basically, you know, high throughput technologies, but also digitization of a lot of the data that is collected during, during routine care, both when you visit outpatient clinics, you visit uh, hospitals, but also now a lot of the variable technologies that are collecting data 24 seven, and you've seen some of it. So what I really want to focus on is I think uh, we often get focused on say, you know, thinking of the PMI cohort. And in thinking about the PMI cohort, really focusing hard only on the molecular data alone, but one of the exciting, I think the, the biggest challenges in front of us is, like we heard earlier today, integrating these heterogeneous data sources. You know, very many different, you know, these data collected at varying levels of granularity. Uh, they're noisy, uh, they're sparse, you know, some are sampled all the time, some are sampled rarely, some are sampled at clinician's discretion, you know, some are text, some are continuous. And uh, on different individuals, you have different amounts of data collected. And what we really want is systems, um, computational and statistical systems that behave more like the way intelligent humans do, which is we take this data, we integrate data as they arrive and make, um, make inferences that allow caregivers or, in the, or the patients themselves to make more, intelli uh, make more intelligent uh, decisions about their own health. So here's an example, um, scleroderma. So scleroderma is a uh, chronic progressive disease. Um, you know, bringing back uh, Dr. Osler's words, um, it very much, uh, scleroderma is only one such disease. There are many such systemic autoimmune diseases, lupus, multiple sclerosis, um, IBD, Crohn's, uh, of course, cancer we know to be a very, not an autoimmune disease, but know to be a very successful example of one where essentially, you know, historically we used to think of it as one disease, but really there's so much heterogeneity across individuals. And the kind of heterogeneity we think about are, for instance, you know, across individuals, different organ systems are affected to varying extent. Even within each individual, it's hard to know, for instance, some are really affected, they have, you know, a, ter uh, a terrible case of lung fibrosis, and uh, others don't. You know, some have, uh, you know, thickening of the skin and others don't. For some, this affects the entire body. For others, it only affects partially some parts of the body. And so treatment is challenging because it's, you know, part of it is uh, thinking about for this person, what is their likely trajectory going to be, which can then allow me to tailor therapy. And, the, and here's an example. Here I'm showing you on the x-axis, it's a plot. On the x-axis is time, it's about 20 years. On the y-axis is a marker they use to track lung, lung function and scleroderma. Every dot is when they walked into the clinic. This, I'm just showing you one measurement here. And they're using this as a means for tracking lung function, so down is bad. And after a couple of years, what you see in the first plot is after a couple of years, they're wondering, is this person going to decline or stay up, right? And that's the kind of decision making that's going on in the caregiver's head. And at that point, you might say, oh, it looks like they just came back up, so it looks like they're going to be space, uh, stable for a while. Fast forward a few years, and you see now there has a, there's a sudden decline going on, right? And the question is, could I have used uh, all of the historical data in an intelligent way to be able to prognosticate what this person's trajectory is going to be, right? And if I could, then I could make decisions like perhaps giving them, you know, treating the, uh, uh, targeting the therapies to their disease progression. So when I take this individual, so I'm looking at this in, uh, an example individual, on the top I'm showing you four different markers. Here we're looking at skin measure, 
a measure of lung function, a measure of the vasculature health and heart health. And the bottom, what I'm doing is, of, of course, there not be a lot of diversity, right? And you, if you put them on a plot, you can see all it looks like is a big amount of mess. Essentially, in particular, if you look at you know, the lung function alone, in the population, there's so much heterogeneity, it's not really clear. Is it just that everybody is different? Or is there some amount of group structure? Is there any kind of structure we can exploit? And how, how do we explain away this kind? Um, how, how, how do we wrap our head around this? So one of the recent exciting, you know, we often have new terms. And so, so uh, you know, Dr. Collins calls this the N of one models. That's becoming very, um, uh, com uh, we often uh, use to refer to this idea of like, how do you look at the individual's data and target target care to this individual. And so one way naively to think about this is, well, I'm just going to take all of this person's data and I'm going to train a model to figure out what to do for this person. Anyone who's ever played with data would know that's a terrible idea because you would overfit so badly and you'd have no way to generalize across individuals. So the real question at hand is, what I'm showing you here are these little round balls of people. Well, I'm a computer scientist, so I think of little uh, people with random uh, nodes. And essentially, attached to each of these random nodes are lots of data and the kinds of data I earlier spoke about. And then the question you're asking is, how do I figure out how to share data across these nodes? What's the graph structure? What's the kind? At what levels of hierarchy should I be sharing, and what? Right? And that's. Um, and so now, in two slides, I'm, since I'm in the statistics and machine learning session, I have to give you a little bit of math. So in two slides, I'll give you a little bit of a glimpse of the technical ideas. So typically, you know, in uh, it, typically the way we think about this as well, it's simple. Let's take all of the observed data about this individual, like the age and gender and genomic markers we have, or autoimmune markers we might have, things we know how to measure. Okay, let's take those and train a model, train a regression model that says, how do these observed markers explain heterogeneity in this outcome, right? The assumption there, though, is that all the variability in your target outcome can be explained by your observed markers alone. Of course, we know that much of the problem with medicine at the moment is that we don't have very good measurement. We, we, there are lots of sources of heterogeneity that are latent, things that we haven't been able to measure yet. So the question is, can we do better than just trying to explain heterogeneity using observed markers alone? And so therein comes this notion of uh, you know, latent variable models or models where we find, try to find structure in the residuals that are unexplained by the observed factors and cluster them at varying levels of granularity to think about how to layer in. What I'm showing you here in this, um, in this slide is basically four different individuals. I take their data, I explain away the trajectory using all the observed factors. I look at the residuals, and what I'm seeing is basically structure in the residuals. And in particular, what you can see is on the left and right, two different subgroups of individuals with very different progression models. And even within each subgroup, you can see individual level variability across. Uh, and, and you can essentially uh, learn this latent structure and characterize it and layer it on top of the observed data to be able to target predictions even better. The other thing that's really important is basically keeping your uncertainties around so that what you're doing is not just sort of giving point estimates, but you're really giving uh, you know, calibrated posteriors that tells you, well, not just you know, which trajectory are they likely to take, what's your belief in them taking these trajectories. So an example here from the same data that I showed you earlier, which looked like mess. Here, what I'm showing you is basically we take scleroderma and we are discovering new subgroups of individuals, subgroups that they previously didn't have in the field as uh, classifications that were known. So in particular, if you look at the third category, I'm showing you groups of individuals who are called now, uh, you know, who we now consider to be late decliners because, you know, they're doing pretty well and they suddenly go through a decline. And the natural question that we're asking is why? What is leading to this kind of late decline? A different kind of question is there are people who do very rapid drop and they stabilize. So what is leading to the stabilization mechanism versus the people who never manage to stabilize, right? So can we distinguish the two? You can couple these models together and um, uh, think about how do you use these models to do online prognosis. So what I'm showing you on the right 
is for one individual, we've built, we've coupled these models together to make prognosis because it's a systemic disease. Of course, what happens to your gastrointestinal tract is going to affect how your lung behaves. And what happens to your lung is going to help me prognosticate what might happen to your uh, heart health. And so here what we're doing is we are basically coupling these models together. And on the, in the plots, what I'm showing you again is on the x-axis, the time uh, in years, and y-axis, the particular marker measurement. In black dots, what I'm showing you is what the machine gets to see as data it's already seen. So that's history. In red, I'm plotting all the dots that are in the future, just as a way to help you understand how the machine is doing relative to what actually ends up happening. So this is we're playing prospectively on this person on whom we have full data. And um, what we're showing is basically the, the predictions here are a, um, a mixture of trajectories. And for each mode, you have um, you know, a mixing coefficient that tells you how likely is this mode. And I'm highlighting here in purple the most likely mode and in green the next most likely mode. So what it's really giving you is essentially a, a sense for, you know, both how confident you are and where you think this likely person is headed. Of course, as new measurements come in, this measurements get, these measurements get automatically updated. So in this particular example, for instance, I'm showing you a person where on the right, if you were just looking at their lung function alone, you know, you might have thought they're doing pretty well. But on the left, when we start to do this integrative analysis across multiple organ systems, coupling these models together, it actually realizes that your vasculature is not doing so well, your skin's not doing so well, so maybe you're actually going to be one of those decliners. And that's basically what you're seeing. Uh, using these kinds of approaches, one thing that's very exciting is that clinical trial recruitment is very challenging in this area, and uh, we're now able to take early data. And here what I'm showing you is the AUC, in other words, our ability to recognize early uh, who are the people who are going to be late decliners for lung function. And if you could recognize those, and after one, two, and four years of data, I'm showing you the AUCs at the bottom. So it's 0.87 after about four years of data. And what that really means is uh, suddenly you can enroll them in trials where rather than trying to recruit all people with scleroderma, you might want to focus on individuals who are likely to have lung function, um, uh, lung dysfunction, so that um, you can target the trials better and re reduce cost of uh, trial recruitment. This is now a system we've deployed and are continually improving. This is a very recent work. In the remaining time, which is two minutes before they kick me out, uh, I'm going to talk, switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about some of the other work very, very briefly. So here we're using these kinds of ideas in the inpatient setting. And here you can see lots of different markers, again, varying different granularities getting collected. Let me give you one very concrete example, sepsis. Sepsis is, what it is uh, the 11th leading cause of death. People with sepsis, 3.9 times higher mortality rate, 2.4 times higher longer length of stay, uh, much higher costs. And the most exciting thing is that actually, if you can detect these individuals early, you can intervene and really make a difference in outcomes. And there's data supporting that. So all, a lot of some of the existing work is really, and actually some work going on here at Stanford, looking at you know, gene expression measurements or, uh, that are changing as someone is developing sepsis. But a lot of those ideas require you to first suspect that maybe this person is at risk, and then you might go ahead and try to make those measurements. What about much like what Feifei spoke about, you know, these notions of um, AI-type technologies that sit in the back constantly looking at these measurements in real time and making assessments about every individual? Because the computer can tirelessly reason through what's going on. And so here, one of the things, this was a cover, ar cover article in Science Translational Medicine that came out last year where we showed that you know, using routinely collected data. And this is what I mean by precision healthcare. We don't have to wait till every person is sequenced. There's so much valuable data that already exists that we can use to transform care and individualize care now. So here in this case, using um, routinely collected data, we show that we could identify patients, uh, people with septic shock, a median of 25 hours early. Let me contrast this with the idea that for every, there's data that support that every hour that treatment is delayed, uh, mortality is being shown to go up by 7 to 8%. So this really gives them a huge window of opportunity to intervene. Um, a very last quick one. This is work actually done at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. Again, looking at bedside monitor data, typically used to be collected and thrown. Again, we see just afterward these neonates. There are signs and symptoms in these physiologic monitor data that are, again, data we used to not think of as valuable. 
that are indicative of downstream outcomes in these individuals. And so here, what we're showing is basically, compared to PhysiScore, which is this tool using just physiologic data, and 40 different year, over 40 years, four different instruments in neonatology, many of these require a large number of measurements, we can very accurately determine, at, you know, very soon after birth, which individual, which babies, which preemies are at risk for major problems of prematurity. And you can now use this to do triage. Um, and again, data routinely collected, non-invasive. I think very, very exciting time for us to think about how to inform care. I'm going to skip this example. This was in Parkinson's using variables, and end by saying, I think um, one of our biggest challenges is going to be about how do we take this deep, heterogeneous data and think about integrating it? And what are the frameworks by which we can make inferences that are robust? Um, these are my, very t uh, my students and uh, colleagues with whom, uh, while I'm here speaking, uh, a lot of people's work went into developing this. This is the, my uh, colleagues in doing work in sepsis, and thank you.